Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And again, it is a journey that is far, far away and a long time ago. Ah. The last show about Harriet Tubman, and it was a Maryland story, I promised you we would venture across the Delaware Bay to Cape May. And so I have with me my guest, and to be frank and up forward about this, he is my first cousin, Jake Oliver. Jake, say hello. Hello. Where? <laughs> Hi. Jake is in Baltimore, and um, Jake lived in Cape May and um, with his mother and father when he was a youngster. And I just got to visit Cape May. So when we discovered this story about uh, Harriet Tubman crossing the Delaware to go to Cape May, it was new to both of us. So I asked Jake if we could talk about Cape May, his memories, and what all of this means. So uh, Eric, can we see uh, Harriet Tubman crossing the Delaware? No knows. Sixteen miles in an open boat. Sixteen miles to freedom across the dark bay. The freedom run began at ten o'clock on a June night in 1860. Six slaves, men and women, found their way to the Maryland shore. They had a boat and planned to cross the Delaware Bay following the beam of the Cape May Lighthouse. They hadn't gotten far when five white men in another boat attacked them. Hit with oars, then pierced by bullets, the determined freedom seekers still made their escape. Rowing fiercely, despite their wounds, they made it across the dark waters and landed on the Jersey shore. The young women were very sick. The men were tried to their last extremity. They were not far from Cape May Lighthouse. William Still, Philadelphia Regional Coordinator of the Underground Railroad. In the decade before the Civil War, many people fleeing slavery in Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia made their way to freedom across the Delaware Bay. But they were not the only ones coming to Cape May a very popular seaside resort at the southern tip of New Jersey. Steamers brought southern planters escaping the summer heat, and abolitionists and underground railroad leaders from Philadelphia. Cape May was the meeting place of north and south. They came for the ocean and the large, luxurious hotels, but there were tense times, too. Fights broke out among slavers and abolitionists and the hundreds of free blacks working in the hotels. Into this scene walked 30-year-old Harriet Tubman, a freedom seeker from Maryland's eastern shore. She came to earn money to return to Maryland to free her family and friends. I was free, but there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land. And my home, after all, was down in the old cabin quarter with the old folks and my sisters and brothers. But to this solemn resolution I came. I was free, and they should be free also. Harriet Tubman. Despite the price on her head, Tubman worked as a cook in Cape May the summer of 1852, perhaps earlier as well. In the fall of 1852, she left Cape May she crossed the bay, rescued nine people on the eastern shore, and led them to freedom in Canada. At the time, Cape May was alive with discussions and meetings of leading Philadelphia abolitionists and underground railroad leaders. There was the remarkable Stephen Smith, who had bought his freedom and become one of the richest black men in the country. Because of him, hundreds of enslaved people reached freedom traveling in the secret compartments he built in his railroad cars. He built a summer home on Lafayette and Franklin Street. Right beside Smith's home was the Banneker House Hotel. 
free black abolitionist from Philadelphia stayed there, and in its rooms they wrote resolutions denouncing slavery, which were circulated by Frederick Douglass in his newspaper. Across the street from Smith's house was a white Baptist church known for issuing anti-slavery resolutions. One prominent member was Joseph Leach, the local newspaper editor who reported on slave escapes to Cape May. We glory in the spunk of our ebony friends, he wrote. Another longtime summer visitor to Cape May was a white Unitarian minister from Philadelphia, William Furness, who was known as a leading abolitionist. Furness called the fight over slavery a battle between barbarism and civilization. In the years after the Civil War, especially in the first half of the 20th century, the area around Smith's house became a vibrant African-American community. In the 1960s and 70s, Cape May restored its distinctive Victorian architecture and history. But at the same time, it lost much of its African-American history, particularly through urban renewal. The Stephen Smith house barely survived, saved only by an emergency telegram from its owner to President Lyndon Johnson. Today, there is an effort by concerned Cape May residents to resurrect that history. The National Park Service has recently recognized Cape May's African-American past, accepting two Cape May contributions related to the Underground Railroad into its Network to Freedom. They are the Cape May Underground Railroad Trolley Tour and the Stephen Smith House. The Tubman Museum is key to this revival. Macedonia Baptist Church and the Mullock family, owners of the historic Chalfont Hotel, plan to showcase this pass in the Harriet Tubman Museum, scheduled to open in 2020. We need your help to create the Harriet Tubman Museum. It will be located in the 19th century home of Quaker businessman George Howell, which is now owned by Macedonia Church and in need of restoration. The plan is to create several display rooms and a large two-story exhibit area, as well as two meeting rooms. The Harriet Tubman Museum is at the center of a neighborhood that tells more than 150 years of the African-American struggle for civil rights and Kate May's part in it. The Howell House is across the street from Stephen Smith's home and steps from the AME Church Smith founded. It's also next door to a relic of segregation, the Franklin Street School. Long vacant, city and county officials now plan to convert it into a library and community center, a place of inclusion. Each of these buildings is at a pivotal point of preservation. The Tubman Museum will be an anchor in this effort to create a lasting reminder and tribute to Kate May's fight for freedom and civil rights. your help to create the Harriet Tubman Museum. Hello, and we're back. And I <laughs> promised you we would go across the bay to Kate May and see what Kate May looked like or what it did look like. And so I'm going to take, uh, went to, lived in Kate May, like I said, I only visited in the summer, but Kate, Kate May, uh, his mother and father, my uncle and aunt, had a place at Kate May at a time when 
of African Americans from Baltimore, Philadelphia, Trenton, all New York, places. Chicago, had they came summer, from all over. Chicago, yeah, had mm-hmm. summer places there. So, mm-hmm. Jay, tell us about Cape May. Cape May was about a, uh, uh, for, for us, uh, the Oliver family, it was a place for me and my sister uh, and our childhood friends uh, would be taken by my mother primarily uh, the day after school closed uh, and for the entire summer we would spend uh, in Cape May playing in, at the beach and um, just doing things that kids do in the summertime play baseball and um, go to Wildwood to get entertained with all the rides there. Uh, but we started Cape May, we started to, to go to Cape May in the summertime um, in 1950. Uh, and, and over uh, the many years uh, as we were growing up, uh, we spent every summer there until uh, we, my sister and I were, uh, you know, adults. Uh, and uh, it was a lot of fun, but it was also, as I, in, in retrospect, it, it's very interesting thinking about how Cape May has evolved and changed. Uh, and and the, the excitement that has been generated by the realization uh, uh, of Harriet Tubman's involvement in Cape May uh, on, on many levels uh, is, is shocking to many, particularly many uh, black folks who really had no clue as to the uh, involvement of this important historic uh, personality, a character um, uh, in uh, African in, in Kate May's history, as well as uh, we knew about her in the Black history, but the fact that she was part of Kate May is is really something that people are very excited about. When I discovered it, I have to tell our audience when I discovered it, I called Jake immediately and sent him the clip, and he called me back in the morning and said, you blew my mind. I didn't know any of this. And so here we are discovering or rediscovering Cape May and all of the historic implications of Cape May. And when you look at the video, and it shows the film in the clip, the 16 miles across the Delaware, it made sense. It made sense to row the boat. 15 miles, and there's no telling how many other people made that same escape. So uh, it's, it was, it's a direct, uh, uh, Marsha, it's a direct line. Uh, nowadays, you can catch a ferry from Lewis, Delaware, straight into Cape May. Uh, and when you are, are on that ferry, uh, it, it really isn't a, a very long ride at all. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's um, the Delaware Bay is is um, it's, it's it's a large body of water, but not that large to really uh, be an impediment in connection with a, a journey that obviously Harriet Tubman and her team were taking uh, back in in the day. Um, uh, it's uh, it, it's it's exciting to stand on the beach at Cape May Point and just look across. The bay at, at Delaware. And well, they, let me, let me they, say they, this for our, our listening audience who, who probably does not know anything about this, the geography. Uh, there's the Atlantic Ocean, and then there's the Delmarva Peninsula, then there's the Chesapeake Bay. At the top of the bay is the Delaware. Okay. Now, the reason it's called Delmarva is at the top of it where it has a landmass is Delaware. And then as you go down the peninsula, it's Maryland, the state of Maryland, and then the final tip is Virginia. Thus the word Delmarva. So it made sense when you think of geography that coming from Cambridge, Maryland, up the peninsula, up to where she got to the tip where she could cross from the Delaware, from Delaware across the bay, Cape May. Like, it just, when you look at the geography, it makes sense. 
In fact, it makes more sense than trying to go inland to cross. You know, mm -hmm. to figure out how, until, when was it, Jake? In the 60s, I guess, before there was a bridge from Baltimore to the eastern shore. Yeah, you, you have to catch the ferry. We have to uh, catch the ferry, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and when you, you get to Delaware, which is a, the bridge today is the Delaware Memorial Bridge. Um, you cross that and you, you're in Jersey. Um, uh -huh. uh, but that you're, you're leaving Delaware, um, crossing Delaware Memorial Bridge, and um, you, that takes you to Jersey. And then you travel south for about 60 miles uh, to the uh, to the very tip of New Jersey, which is where Cape May is located. Uh, and uh, Cape May ends at a place uh, called Cape May Point, which is the very tip end of New Jersey. New Jersey is shaped like a peanut, yeah. but it comes to a sharp point at the southernmost most part of, of the of, of the state, uh, and that point is 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 Cape May, but uh, it, the point is Cape May Point, and you can you can stand on the beach at Cape May Point, and and really on one side you have the Atlantic Ocean, on the on the right side you have uh, the Delaware Bay. Yes, and that's uh, that is what I know. I guess it was that we don't have a map, but. For all of you that go and Google Cape May, and you can see the configuration, and you see how it, the tip of Delaware goes into Maryland, and it only makes sense coming from the eastern shore of Maryland up there. It, that, that looks like the best escape route. Anything else would have to cross the Chesapeake, and from Baltimore to the eastern shore until the... 50s, I guess it was. There was no bridge. You had to go by ferry. So, um, I guess if we thought this through before now, we would have figured out that Cape May was the logical place to go. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, so, Jake, as now tell us about the uh, the fact that this was a huge. Uh, community of well-to-do uh, black people that came from all over the United States to Cape May in the summer. Some people stayed all year. Like your father was there all year until the last time I saw him. Was yeah, well, he retired in, in Cape May. Yeah, um, Cape May. But most of his life, he basically worked in Baltimore and he was in Baltimore, yeah. his wife and kids to Cape May for three months in the summertime. Yeah. Uh, for anybody that uh, his father, my mother's brother, was one of my very favorites of all of my uncles, and we had lots of uncles. But he was my favorite. And Jake, I don't know if you, the last conversation I had with your father was in February of the year he passed, and he asked me if I would be his valentine. And every time I think about it, I still cry. You know? <laughs> Nobody else has ever asked me to be their Valentine. <laughs> so, yeah, I can't believe that, uh, Marsh. As pretty as you are, I'm pretty sure you have lots of requests. <laughs> oh, you're <yes>, sweetheart. <laughs> See, that's what happens with cousins. They tell you nice things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but. Now tell me about, again back to this culture in Cape May. Uh, well, Cape May was um, during the time when I when we were there um, in the summertime growing up. Uh, it was uh, it, it was occupied by middle class African Americans uh, who uh, rented or were fortunate enough to buy houses there, uh, summer homes there. Um, uh, now, Cape May is, 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 is occupied uh, mostly by hotels uh, because it's a resort. Um, and um, because there were so many hotels, um, not only did you have a, a large uh, uh, middle-class, black middle-class uh, 
for the summer, but you also had um, a lot of, of young black, mostly college kids coming up from the South and other places uh, to work in these hotels uh, at the summer. And uh, in, in the early days, when we first started going to Cape May in the 1950s, Cape May was, well, it was like being in the South. Uh, and it was, of course, a Southern Jersey, Jersey as well. But uh, the point was, it, it was, uh, Cape May was segregated, like just about a lot of places around there. Um, and uh, so there were very few places that uh, black folks could, could really uh, go, but we found um, that there were restaurants, uh, there were hotels. As a matter of fact, one of the first places that we stayed when we visited Ho um, Cape May was a black hotel, um, but it was only for blacks. Uh, and uh, we couldn't more or less stay at any of the other large hotels which were employing uh, many of the young African-American uh, college kids who were coming up for summer jobs. Um, so it, it, it served, uh, Cape May was serving multiple levels of purposes. You know, it was a resort. Uh, we had a, a beach, Grant Street Beach was, was the Black Beach. Um, we had a Black lifeguard. Um, and um, everybody knew that when you get to Cape May, you look for uh, the Grand Street Beach, because that was the only beach that you could really go to. Of course, as the years rolled on, um, it opened up, and it became more diverse and more integrated. And, um, and it really, I don't really have a sense that Cape May had a, a, any major problems becoming integrated, but uh, initially, as, as, a, as a young, as a, as a kid, I, I remember that there were limitations that we had to deal with. But Cape May, nevertheless, is mostly, uh, from my perspective, uh, is, is remembered as being, number one, a very beautiful location, um, uh, had pleasant weather, a great beach, uh, and lots of things to do. Um, they even had a zoo in Cape May, which most people really? didn't even realize. Yes, they no, did. I don't remember. I don't remember that, but I... Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's still there, but it, it was it was off the beaten path. It wasn't anything big like you had like the Baltimore Zoo or the Bronx Zoo, but I mean, it was a zoo, and they had some animals there, and people would go there. Um, but no, Cape May was a, a resort, and had, it was lots of fun. Uh, now, from the blacks' perspective, uh, the, the the black enclaves uh, where we lived, most of the blacks lived uh, a lot of them. A lot of us uh, lived in um, West Cape May. West Cape May was was heavily populated by uh, by African Americans, uh, and um, everybody knew everybody else uh, from Second Avenue through up to Sixth Avenue. Um, and bicycling was the best way to get around because Cape May was so small. Uh, you could really do a lot of go cover a lot of distances. Uh, in a short period of time uh, on your bicycle. And as kids, uh, we were always exploring, always exploring. Uh, but also, Cape May being on the Atlantic Ocean, um, it was it had great fish, great seafood, um, and the restaurants were, were really quite good. Um, as a kid, growing up through my teenage years, I must, I think I worked. Uh, and, and mostly, most of the large hotels down to Cape May. And, uh, well, I, I would think so. You know, that just makes sense. That yes. Youngsters work hotels, you know. Well, that's where you get to know more people. I mean, uh, I, 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 I was, uh, I work as a, uh, as a cook's helper or as a dishwasher or, and, and in the course of that, you, you meet all the, the, the people who were coming up from North Carolina uh, who were in college, and, and you really began to develop a, quite an extensive network of, of and, and getting to learn, uh, at, you know, other blacks and what they're like and what they're doing in other other places that you haven't more or less visited. 
Um, and uh, when Cape May started to become more integrated, then you you really started to you know stretch out. Um, the, by the time I guess 1963, 64, um, I yeah, you know, I mean, some of my 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 friends were from Canada who I w- was working with, and they uh, they were were not black, um, but we would explore and you know just have a good time during the summer when we weren't working uh, at whatever hotel or restaurant or bakery that we happened to be uh, employed at that time. Um, Cape May was fun. Uh, and, and to know and to learn that it's uh, uh, really a, an important location in African-American history makes it even more, uh, stand out more, and, and, and particularly my memory, and I can't help but believe that it's, it, it has rocked uh, the realization of many of the uh, people that I know who grew up in Cape May. Um, when I share with them the uh, uh, the uh, articles uh, about uh, Harry Tubman's involvement in Cape May and the photos of uh, Harry Tubman's um, uh, loca- locations that had some importance in 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 her with her uh, presence uh, in the Cape May area, um, m- most people are absolutely floored and, and excited <laughs> and eager to learn more. Eager to yeah, well, learn. you know. When I discovered, I called you immediately because I was, wow. Yeah. (laughs) This is, sweetheart, (sighs) we are just about out of time. But it's been a pleasure spending this time with you. And we'll have to do this again. I look forward to it, Marcia. All right. (laughs) Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Aloha. And we'll see you next year. Okay.